Hey, Hawk here. And I had the recent opportunity to hang out with an amazing DJ electronic music producer, Jordan Atkins Loria. His stage name is DJ Lucky Date or Lucky Date. I wanted to sit down and talk with him a little bit about what he's doing because he's cooking up some just fantastic fat beats and remixes and he's doing it all in reason. He also does tutorials online at his YouTube channel. I'll put the address here, which is really cool because he talks all the time about the things he's doing in Reason. But I wanted to kind of get more in depth with him and discuss a little bit about his background, about how he handles the files after they're done. I'm just really intrigued by the work he's doing and how he's getting his material out there. And he's not making excuses and he's learning as he goes. And I think it's just, it's a great model for, for being a producer, uh, for being an artist, for getting your music out and sharing it with the rest of the world. And I predict big things for him. So let's uh, check, out, check out what he had to say here. Lucky day, lucky day, lucky day. So you dropping the DJ? Drop it. I, I don't know. Some people say the DJ before. I've never said DJ, but some people just because my website says DJ, yeah. call me that. But a luckyday.com was taken, so I had to uh, be DJ okay. Lucky All Day. Right. Well, I think yeah. DJ Lucky Day has a nice photo. Oh, it does? Let's okay. Go. Well, let's do that. Let's roll yeah. with that. I don't, I don't right. mind. Yeah, let's do it. You've done all these amazing tutorials online for Reason. You did the little propeller head interview. Uh -huh. uh, it's so wonderful that all these production tips and tricks you're sharing with everybody. And, and, and I want to be able to say, you know, thanks for that. Well, thank all, you for, just, for watching and appreciating them. It's, it's, it's really good stuff. Thank it, you. It's really good stuff. There's so much stuff that you've put out online about what you do in Reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to rehash that. Okay. I want to jump forward and talk about uh, like what you mentioned just briefly at the end of your Propellerhead interview which is uh, what happens after Reason? What, uh, are you mixing everything in Reason? Um, how are you mastering it? Because okay. you mentioned something about logic. So what, right. what is the process there? Okay, so the process is I'm writing pretty much everything in Reason. I have a couple times used uh, plugins in logic, written since, and then resampled in Reason, but I've never rewired Reason into another program. So I've never actually uh, composed another program. So okay. every time I've sampled, it's always ended up back inside Reason. Okay. I've only done that twice, I think, though. Um, so once that's, so I do all the mixing and all the like writing in Reason, and then I export the wave, and I throw it in Logic, and I use the Waves L2 limiter to mm -hmm. just turn it up a bit, okay. and I don't do anything else. Okay. Uh, I've... The one thing I've never learned, and actually I was excited when I was doing Berkeley till I got too busy to be doing it, I wanted to do the mastering courses because I don't know hardly anything about mastering. Yeah. I just use my ear, but I don't know at all like what the routine is for it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't even touch EQs or compressors towards the end because so, I'm just, a, I'm, I never learned that at all. So no multi-band compression and stereo phasing? And no. Like, <laughs> I, I, I wish. Um, I, I have sent out, sometimes when my songs are released, they get sent to uh, mastering. Okay. Um, but generally, I don't like the masters that come back. Really? Because Do tell. I think that a lot of masters in electronic music world, are not the, the mastering agencies they send to are not used to electronic music. Mm -hmm. uh, they're probably more used to live music or even just, I think, mastering. Uh, Engineers probably get a lot of business from like radio ads and stuff like that. So they might be just dealing with vocals, uh, but when they get electronic music, I think they don't. They can get scared by it sometimes, and they think that it just needs to be really, really loud. Because mm -hmm. pretty much every time I get it done by a professional, it comes back almost distorted sounding. The kick doesn't sound good in the club anymore. Everything's okay. just a little bit too big, and I always write back and say, "Can you please turn like lower this down? It does not need to be that. It doesn't need to be brick walled. It doesn't need to be like that." Um, the only time I really had a master done professionally that I liked was with a uh, remix I just did for Ultra Records. So whoever does the mastering for Ultra Records, I was really into it. Ah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, well, Ultra obviously knows their dance tracks. Their yeah, medium, right, exactly. So I think they, so. Found, they found the right yeah. one. But that sounded great, and it was something I knew I couldn't do. But on the other times, I prefer just my, my mix. And I think that 
I don't know. People always ask me. A lot of the tracks I haven't even thrown in Logic. Sometimes it's just right out of reason into it, and people are okay. always wondering how I got the mastering. But it's really, I think, it comes down to the mixing because I do hardly anything for mastering. I okay. I spend a lot of time using uh, compressors and limiters on each band right. and mixing to right. create the final product. Okay, so you're mixing everything in Reason. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, what kind of monitors and stuff are you using? I have the I've used the Yamaha HS eighties for how long has it been? Maybe a year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the last four months, I've had the Atom A seven Xs. Okay, those are nice. I love those. So those are now my primary. I use the Yamahas as a secondary reference. Um, and then I have a Yamaha sub that I never produce with, but I always listen to it when I just like at the end of a at the end of a production day I'll turn it on to see what it would sound like in a clip. Right, right. But I don't produce I don't write with that on. Um and yeah I mean for the the majority of my production career I was on THX Best Buy speakers. Yeah. And then it was a year and a half ago that I got my first Yamaha's and then I moved up to Adams. Yeah. I think the next move might be the Genlec um I, I don't know what they're called. They're the ones with the they're not a square anymore. I mean, they're not circular, they're square. Okay. They have maybe a 10 inch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Genelex are nice and expensive. They are. Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm, I'm waiting for it. That's why I don't have them yet. <laughs> so do you, uh, do, you have, um, do you have a monitor controller or anything like that? Like a little switching big knob yeah. back to you or something? I have a, oh, what, I don't know what company it is, but basically it's a square with a master volume and knob in the middle, and it has up to four references that you can use. I think that's a ProSonus, isn't it? Right. That's yeah. probably right. right. It's and a you square. have a U button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. That's what I use. All right. And I, that thing, like, I always saw guys with it, and I was like, yeah, I don't really need that. But once I got it, it changed everything for me, because I'm switching references all the time. Uh -huh. I'm like, it's pretty great. And especially when you have your four headphone jacks and stuff. Right, it's, yeah, it's awesome. yeah, it's really nice. You do a lot of remixes. You've got a lot, some pretty big remixes coming out and everything else. Are you you doing all your remixes in Reason as yeah, well? Yeah. How uh, actually will record? I guess you're you're on Reason. I'm in Reason now. now yeah. yeah. Um, how do you deal with that in terms of like bringing in stems or um, and and there's not because there's not a there's not a tempo sync thing in inside of Reason right where you can say you know uh, clock my session to this. You know, that's right. Loop. What, how are you dealing with all well, that? Well, what I do, basically when I'm remixing a song, it's not 100% of the time, but 95% of the time it's a dance song to start. The original was a dance music song, mm -hmm. which means that the drums are already going to be to an exact tempo. I don't do much live. Uh, I don't remix many live songs, which means that the beat is already to a grid, so I just have to find out what the original tempo was. Mm -hmm. And when you upload a, a stem into Reason 6 with the audio, you just tell it what tempo the original was at, and then once you adjust the tempo, it adjusts the music with it. Okay. So, it's, uh, so it's fairly sure. easy that way. So I haven't, I haven't yet run into the problem where I get a drum groove gotcha. that's not to a, a grid, and it needs to be to a grid. I would probably have to use Ableton or Logic or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha, that, right. Because yeah. the stems that you're coming in, they'll, they'll like tell you what the original tempo is and everything. Is that where so if they like, don't, I'll run them through, even Serato, my DJ software or something mm -hmm. like that, will tell you the exact tempo, and then I'll... Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and how are you treating the vocals? Once you do, you do you like keep them as tracks, or do you like turning them into rex files or samples, or? What do you so do before I was using Record in Reason Six, everything was rex, uh, and then right towards the end, before the switch, I started using a lot of NNXT stuff. I like just say, resampling the vocals mm -hmm. uh, or throwing up a rex file into the NNXT instead of the Dr. Rex. Um, but then once I got Record, you could just once audio was possible, I never looked back. I still use the Rex for some loops and stuff that are already Rex files, but yeah, any audio file that comes in, I, th I throw it right in. So you're doing all your audio editing right in, in Reason now? And right, and I've chopping. actually used the Neptune quite a bit lately, that new uh, vocal synthesizer. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the auto tuner kind of effect yeah. on there. And, uh -huh. yeah. So do you have any uh, advice to uh, aspiring remixers? Well, uh, I think I do have some advice, and I've never I've never actually given this advice before, but it's something I've uh, I've always felt, which is when you get a remix, it really is important. Even if you think you have a really cool concept and that you could go off and pretty much turn it into original and just use a few of the original stems, even though that it might end up sounding better that way, 
A lot of the times when you're asked to do a remix, it's really important that you really are thinking about that original track when you make it. Because uh, I've come across the problem where like I'll get a remix that I don't like very much, and instead of saying no, I won't do it, I'll accept, but then I'll write an original, and then I'll just take like a little vocal sample from it, mm -hmm. and that's the remix. And it actually ends up making like the original artist feel bad. It doesn't look good when you have a remix come out that doesn't really sound like a remix at all. I think it's really good when you get a remix. If you choose to do it, you should... You can change it up completely, but you, I think there needs to be some soul from the original that comes back out to it. And that's what I've been doing lately in my remixes that I didn't used to do at all. I used to not think about that at all, but I think it's really important to, to keep some essence of an original into a remix. Uh -huh. And I think there's also nothing wrong with remixing like they used to remix back in the day, which was very little in the production sense, but really just remixing it. And it does, I don't think you should just remix something, but just the littlest changes, and it doesn't have to be that different, but a newish take, I don't think it needs to be that drastic a change, because a lot of people think that you have to completely rebuild a song to do a remix, and I don't think that's true. Right. I, I think that's really great advice. Do you have any, um, any uh, technical advice uh, in terms of, of using Reason 6 to remix? Um, yeah. Uh, Anything else off your head that that you do or that um, some, some way that you usually set up your sessions or... When I'm doing a remix, generally, I'll, I'll upload all the stems that I have into and I'll kind of build the song out. It depends on what I'm given because sometimes you'll get four bar loops of just like drums, bass, vocals mm -hmm. and you won't be able to build the track. But if you're given all the stems, I think it's really cool to lay out the entire song and look at what they did and then listen to it as a full song. Start muting things and really come up in your head on what you want to do to it. But if you're only given little short pieces, then I really think it's a good idea to listen to that original song maybe two or three times straight. Just get it really into your head, and then go to the drawing board and start messing around. Um, I've never, the only thing I've never done in a remix, I've used every stem I've ever gotten except drums. I've never used drums from a remix. So I guess that's one of the first things I do is create new drums. Because hmm. I, I think that's like, something that really sets something apart and lets you know that it's a remix, is even if it has all the same synths on top, just a, a new drum group can make it sound like a completely different song. So that's where I start out, I think. All these amazing DJ gigs you're doing these days, yeah. what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of system are you running on? I run, actually. well, okay, so when I originally started DJing, I didn't know how to DJ. I got booked for a couple gigs and I'd only made music. Yeah. And so I was like, well, how am I going to perform? So it's actually funny. The first gig I ever had, I hired, I didn't hire, I asked my friend who was a DJ to DJ for me. And I kind of just stood next to her and danced. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> but it was like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I have this gig that I have, but I don't, I don't know what to do. Oh, so after that, I was like, okay, I'm never doing that again. Cause that was really awkward. So I then was like, okay, well, DJ is going to take a little while to learn. Why don't I go buy a program? So I bought a program uh, by Native Instruments called Tractor, mm -hmm. which uh, beat synced for you, so you didn't have mm -hmm. the beat match. Um, and so for the first, this was when I was 18, so this is about three years ago, so or four years ago now, um, uh, for the first maybe four or five gigs I did, I used Tractor. And looking back now, it's so easy to, to, you, to do the things that I was having problems with, but I was having lots of problems hooking the wires in, um, and I was just stressing out before shows and feeling like I couldn't get everything set up. Uh, and finally, I had a show where I couldn't get it set up, and I kind of had to just stand on stage, and no music came out for like 30 minutes. And that was like wow. very traumatizing, and it was my first <laughs> oh, big gig at the time. So oh, that's when I, the next day, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy CDJs, and actually learn how they, to beat match and DJ. Uh, really? Yeah, so I bought CDJs, and for the next year, I practiced, and I learned how to beat match. And so for a while, I was just doing CDJs in the mixer. Um, and, uh, once I started touring more, I switched to Serato, mm -hmm. which is very similar to just CDJ mixing. The only thing is that your music is stored on your computer. You don't have to, uh, carry around all your, uh, CDs with you, but, which sounds like nothing for people that had to carry around vinyl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that with, uh, Serato, the difference, the main difference between Serato and Tractor is that on Serato, you're just using time code CDs and basically it's the exact same thing as just using CDs, mm -hmm. but on Tractor it's doing a beat sync for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been using Serato for a while and I'm actually thinking about going back to Tractor because the effects in Tractor 
are pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And can't get those on the mixer and can't get those in Serato mm -hmm. right now. So I'm, I'm thinking about doing it. So well, there's definitely something to be said about. I mean, it's it's. I think it's great that you went back to the basics. You know, you, mm -hmm. you said that, you know, you could be doing something with Tractor, but to go back to the basics and have the two CDDJs uh, and learn how to beat match, that's just that's a great fundamental. And then uh -huh. from there, you can and jump off and do whatever needs to be done. And right. you're ready for any anything that comes along. Right, yeah, that's really important because I can't tell you how many times I've gone to gigs where at least one of the DJ's gear doesn't work, and that means they can't play. So the ability to be able to play on CDs, a USB, Serato, Tractor, even vinyl, means a lot because it means that you're going to be able to perform no matter what might happen at the show. Right. You're ready for anything. That's, that's good. That's really good advice. I like that. Call in a